Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, my name is Chris Rich and I am the Vice President of Development with the Gluten Intolerance Group. Uh, thanks for joining us and welcome to GIG's Gluten-Free Labels 101 webinar. Um, before I introduce our esteemed panel who's going to be speaking for you today, I want to give you a little bit of a background as to why we feel that this webinar is important uh, for the gluten-free audience. Uh, as a part of this great community, you likely, you're following social media, you're following the news, and you see the confusion out there around labels, around ingredients, and statements that you can find on some of the food packages. So for example, a package might say it's gluten-free, but on that same package it says it's made in a facility that processes wheat. Or a product has a gluten-free statement on it, but you have a home test that says it contains gluten, so you don't know which one to trust in that case. So we see these consumer questions, and we know that part of our mission here at GIG is to empower the gluten-free community through consumer support and education. And so we feel this webinar is important for us to try to help address some of this confusion. Um, our gluten-free certification organization, GFCO, we are the lead, we're the leading uh, third-party gluten-free certification program in North America. And with almost 50,000 certified products in 27 countries worldwide, we have that expertise and the experience uh, to help address these questions about labels and logos. And we want to use today's webinar and some targeted marketing as we move forward to aid with the uh, educational process. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to the panel who's going to be providing you their expertise and answering your questions today. Uh, first, we have Laura Allred, uh, GIG's Regulatory and Standards Manager. Uh, Laura's background is in immunology, and she spent eight years directing a food testing laboratory and a test kit manufacturing operation. So I'm going to say hello to Laura. Hi, Chris. Sorry, had myself muted there. That's all right. That's right. Uh, next, we have uh, Lola O'Rourke. Uh, she is GIG's education supervisor. Uh, Lola is a registered dietitian and nutritionist, and she helps GIG uh, develop our educational content and helps also to address consumer questions in um, areas like our Frequently Asked Questions uh, forum and, and other places such as social media. So, hello to you, Lola. Hello. Glad to be here. And uh, we're also honored to have on this webinar Shannon Quinn. Uh, Shannon is the Vice President of Food Safety here at GIG. Uh, she oversees our two certification programs, uh, the before mentioned GFCO program and our Gluten-Free Food Service Certification Program, or GFFS. Uh, Shannon's been with GIG since the time we certified our fifth company, and so she's been instrumental in growing the program to the extent of where it is today. Uh, so hello to Shannon. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. So uh, some housekeeping items before we start our presentation. Um, you've probably seen we have some poll questions as part of the webinar. When you get a chance, please address those as you can. Um, also, if you have any questions for our panel about this topic, uh, please utilize the questions box that's, uh, or the chat box in the menu um, there to the right and uh, bring those to our attention that way. Um, we also will be taking questions through our Twitter site, so a couple of those. Um, you can go to uh, at gluten.org, and the handle at Twitter is at gluten, D-O-T-O-R-G. It's spelled out. And then also at handle GF Food Service. Uh, we're going to be um, also integrating questions into the presentation itself, uh, but due to time, we might not be able to get to everyone's questions live. If that happens, we're going to do our best and make sure that we get a response to you um, as soon as we can. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first up today is going to be Laura, and I'm going to go ahead and give Laura a presentation. Uh, she's going to speak uh, on the regulations uh, behind food allergen labeling, um, how these coincide um, and sometimes conflict with gluten-free labeling regulations, um, as well as uh, talking about defining uh, precautionary labeling. So again, Laura, thank you for uh, joining us today, um, and go ahead and take it away. Uh, thanks, Chris, and thanks everybody for uh, coming today to talk about labeling with us. Um, I can tell you in, in my job, I get questions every day about food labels and ingredients, so I know there's a lot of confusion out there about label reading for gluten-free foods. Um, the FDA has an update of nutrition labels that's set to go into effect. Uh, I think they've moved it now to 2020. It was supposed to be 2018, but I think they pushed it back. But unfortunately, that update won't cover anything about allergen or gluten labeling, so with no changes in sight, uh, we all need to try to interpret and understand the, the current labeling practices. 
Um, a, a good bit of the label confusion actually stems from the labeling regulations themselves. Uh, gluten is mentioned in two different labeling laws, uh, the first being FALCPA, or the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004, and the second being the more recent gluten-free labeling regulation. Um, if you look at the findings at the beginning of FALCPA that are here, um, they sort of outline the reasons for writing FALCPA, and it mentions that part of the impetus for the law um, was the importance of celiac disease. So as a consumer, you'd think, great, this law is going to help me find safe, gluten-free foods. But when you get further into the act, you see what it really regulates are what we sometimes call the big eight allergens. Now, this does include wheat, which is also a primary gluten source, but here it's really in reference to wheat as an allergen. This law was written back in 2004, or finalized in 2004, so it's likely the FDA hadn't come up with their final definition of the sources of gluten. And with wheat being the primary gluten grain in the U.S., this regulation probably has kept some people from buying the wrong product. Um, but by leaving out barley, rye, and their hybrids, it didn't give the whole picture, and it now creates some confusion for consumers. Um, the FDA actually recognized this uh, because when they were done with FALCPA, FALCPA um, they called for the creation of additional gluten-free labeling regulations. So it wasn't until 2007, and that's actually two years after GFCO started certifying products, uh, that the FDA tried to improve the labeling for gluten by issuing uh, the proposed rule on gluten-free labeling of foods. Uh, they created a rule that said when manufacturers could voluntarily label their products gluten-free, which is a different approach than uh, FALPA. Um, FALPA calls for highlighting hazards in the ingredient list as opposed to saying when something is safe. And there were some good reasons for taking this approach, uh, primarily a lot of consumer feedback that indicated that consumers would rather have positive statements of food safety instead of having to search the ingredient list for anything that's dangerous. Um, but now with this new rule, you quickly ran into what appears to be a contradiction with FALCPA. So the second and third definitions, the second and third bullet points you see on here of what can and cannot be labeled gluten-free indicate that gluten grains, and here they're using wheat as an example, can be processed to remove gluten and then labeled gluten-free. So while wheat flour obviously can't be gluten-free, Wheat starch that's been sufficiently processed can bear a gluten-free label. And those of us at GFCO don't disagree with this ruling. We actually do certify products that contain wheat starch. We also certify products that contain wheat grass because the grass does not contain gluten proteins. But under FALCPA, wheat starch and wheat grass would both need to be called out as coming from wheat, either in the ingredient list or in a separate contained statement. So this can create a seeming conflict and definite confusion for gluten-free consumers. The, the question then is, are these ingredients dangerous or not? And the answer lies in the fact that wheat allergy is a different thing than celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. Um, while some people with wheat allergy do react to gluten proteins, some of them have a reaction to other wheat proteins or even to repetitive carbohydrate structures in wheat. So this is unfortunately a necessary contradiction in these laws because of the different nature of wheat allergy and gluten-related diseases. Uh, the FDA also recognizes this difference, which is why you can see uh, what looks like a contradiction on your food labels. And this is an area where we see the need for more consumer education to help people understand this difference, things like, like this webinar we're doing today. Uh, so. So for any whole wheat product, FALPA and the gluten-free regulation are always going to be in agreement. Where you see the differences is when the wheat is fractionated to make a product like starch, or when a part of the wheat other than the grain is used as an ingredient. And there's one other specific uh, area where FALPA and the gluten-free regulation align, and that's in the exemption for highly refined oils. So something like wheat germ oil, would not need to be called out as an allergen source, and it could also be labeled gluten-free. So Laura, a question that I have is, we talked about FALPCA, 
and when it was established and, and the FDA being involved. What, what input did the gluten-free community and experts on the topic have uh, when they were discussing these regulations? Quite a bit. I mean, anytime the FDA puts out a proposed regulation, they have a lengthy comment period. And that's, that's likely why at the end of the, the process for FALCBA, they realized it wasn't sufficient for gluten-free labeling and then decided that they needed to do an additional gluten-free regulation after that. So, yeah, people, if you, if you hear about these regulations coming out or you hear about proposed rules from the FDA, it's really important that people go to the FDA website and, and put up comments. You know, they want to hear from consumers just as much as they want to hear from companies. So it's important for people to get feedback. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, so then just to, to finish up some of the, the conflicts we get between in the regulations there, um, the other one we uh, see is the one that I mentioned earlier, uh, that FALCPA only requires wheat labeling, while the gluten-free regulation covers wheat, barley, rye, and their hybrids. So consumers who think that wheat is being called out in the ingredient list because of gluten might also assume that rye and barley would be highlighted too if they were present. And I personally have sometimes thought that adding barley and rye to the FALPA labeling requirements would really be beneficial. And in Canada, they actually do it this way. All primary gluten sources are labeled just like allergens. But you do still need the additional gluten-free labeling regulation because of the differences um, between celiac disease and wheat allergy that I mentioned a minute ago. So, Laura, with Falca, so, it's been, I'm like sorry. you said, I'm sorry, I was going to ask for another Go question. So it's, been, it's been 13 years since Falca, and you said that there's been, and we know there's been changes, and the community and the industry has involved a lot, or evolved a lot, I should say. So, with the demand of new products and the increasing, have they, is there any review of these regulations? Uh, do we know if there will be any updates or changes made to keep up with where we're going as an industry? Yeah, like I said, they have an update plan for the nutrition labeling, so your fats, proteins, carbohydrates, that kind of stuff that's supposed to take effect in 2020. I haven't seen uh, any plan to review the, the allergen labeling portion of that. And, and, you know, to me, the primary thing to add would be listing gluten sources, uh, highlighting them like you do allergens. Uh, they do review these laws, but they don't review them frequently. So uh, unless they get a lot of push, again, from consumers or industry, um, they probably don't get around to changing them very often. All right, so then I'll just go ahead and summarize for you the, the, the conflicts we get into between FALPA and the gluten-free labeling regulation that are, uh, first off, that FALPA only names wheat, as an allergen, while the gluten-free regulation correctly recognizes wheat, rye, barley, and their hybrids as gluten sources. And number two, um, the fact that wheat ingredients can be allergens without being gluten sources. And the FDA did recognize this second issue because if you read through the gluten-free labeling regulation, it says that if you have a wheat ingredient in your product, but it's not a gluten source, so something like wheat starch, you can only label that product gluten-free if you add additional wording to the package explaining how the product can have a wheat ingredient but be labeled gluten-free. Um, I haven't seen many products come out with this packaging. There have been a couple. Um, but without this additional wording, the product is considered mislabeled because it is so confusing for people. So the way you guys might see these conflicts when you're out shopping is in the ingredient list. And um, the FDA always requires that ingredients be listed by their common or usual name. Uh, most manufacturers will only add the word wheat into or after the common or usual name of an ingredient because that's what's required by FALCBA. So if you're expecting to see this kind of thing for rye or barley-based ingredients, a lot of the times you won't. Um, and this does lead to some concerns for gluten-free consumers because there are some barley-based ingredients that have common or usual names that don't include the word barley, like malt. Um, I've also highlighted a list here on the right that has just the word vinegar, and Lola, who's going to be talking to you next here, she and I had a, a discussion about this the other day, about whether manufacturers are actually required to use the name malt vinegar 
if it is in fact a malt vinegar or if they can just call it vinegar like someone has, has done here. And I, don't, I can't tell from this list what kind of vinegar this is. Now there is actually an FDA guidance document out there that describes how vinegar should be named. If anybody wants to see that, I can put up the link. Um, but since that's not part of a major regulation, I can't ever say for sure if manufacturers are just using the word vinegar to describe malt vinegar. And that's just another example of the kind of confusion that gluten-free consumers face every day. Uh, and thankfully, it's the kind of thing we catch at GFCO when we review ingredient lists for our certified products. So if this came in for us, we would make them clarify whether this was a malt vinegar or a distilled vinegar. Now, if the labeling regulations weren't confusing enough, we also have the addition now of precautionary allergen labels, things like may contain or processed on shared equipment. Um, a statement that says contains can only be used when an ingredient is intentionally added, not just because the manufacturer suspects some level of cross-contamination. But remember that the contains statement is only going to reference wheat and not other gluten sources because it's a FALFA requirement. Uh, because we find that these statements can be confusing to consumers, uh, GFCO wanted to know why manufacturers were using them. So we did a survey of our clients that use these precautionary labels and found that 60% of them said that they use them in order to provide transparency for the customers. So they feel that consumers want to know this information. Um, most food manufacturing plants aren't dedicated to wheat-free or gluten-free production. And in those that aren't, the company either wants to make consumers aware of this, or in some cases, they are asked to use these statements by their legal departments. Um, a plant will usually use a may contain statement when wheat is handled somewhere else in the plant, separate from gluten-free production, um, and a shared equipment statement when they process wheat-containing products on the same production lines. Keep in mind that in most cases, these statements are in relation to wheat as an allergen and not as a gluten source. Uh, there are no tests on the market that allow plants to confirm that a product or the facilities or the equipment have no wheat allergens, unlike gluten, which they can easily test for. Um, thankfully, the number of facilities and production lines dedicated to gluten-free manufacturing continues to grow. So we're hoping we'll see fewer statements like these, but for now, they're still pretty common. So we certainly understand that it can be jarring for consumers to see a may contain wheat statement on a product that's certified uh, gluten-free by GFCO. So we kind of wanted to walk through how these statements should be interpreted on a GFCO certified product. Uh, keep in mind that GFCO audits every production facility that makes certified products every year in order to make sure that their production practices are appropriate. GFCO also requires equipment cleaning between every gluten-containing and gluten-free production run, as well as methods in testing to verify and validate that the cleaning methods are effective. Um, GFCO also requires finished product testing in every plant that makes certified products. So the presence of precautionary labeling on a product does not in any way invalidate the GFCO gluten-free certification. All GFCO certified products contain less than 10 parts per million of gluten, which is twice as strict as the FDA threshold. So if you see, for instance, a may contain statement on a GFCO certified product, usually means that the plant handles wheat somewhere else in the facility. Again, this caution is largely about wheat as an allergen because people can have allergic reactions to proteins that are present um, below 10 ppm. In a plant that makes GFCO certified products, Wheat will always be segregated from the gluten-free ingredients and kept away from uh, gluten-free products during production. If you see a statement like processed on, a shared, on shared equipment with wheat, um, this statement indicates exactly what it says. But remember that plants manufacturing in this kind of environment have very strict cleaning protocols and testing requirements to make sure their products meet the GFCO 10 ppm threshold. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, plants can confirm the gluten-free status of their equipment and products through testing, but there are no tests that can detect all possible wheat allergens. So this is a precaution for people with wheat allergies. And if you see a contains 
statement, a contains wheat statement on a GFCO certified product, check to make sure that there's additional language that clarifies that the wheat source is not also a gluten source. For instance, uh, it might say this product contains wheat starch that has been processed to meet the definition of gluten free. And if you ever see a product that has a contains wheat statement and doesn't have that additional language, or if you see any other labeling that seems contradictory or confusing, please contact us and let us know. Um, you know it's really important that we make sure the labeling is consistent on GFCO products. want to make pe sure people you know, can believe in the label. So thank you. So Laura, a couple of questions that have come in uh, that uh, we may have touched on or you may have touched on, but to again reiterate, um, we had a question come in that asked, you know, also if there are other products produced in a facility of wheat, is the disclaimer required on the product? So in a may contain or shared equipment situation, there would not need to be an additional disclaimer about, you know, that the the material doesn't contain gluten. It's only with that contain statement that they have to have that additional wording. Okay, and then another one that we've received is, are, are there products, and again, um, this is, uh, again, important information to repeat, are there products that have both a precautionary label as well as a certification label, and are those products safe for me? Yes, we definitely see products out there where people are using may contain wheat or processed on shared equipment with wheat statements on GFCO certified products. In a lot of cases that that warning, well in every case that warning is based on concerns about wheat allergies, not about gluten because they can test their equipment, make sure it's clean and free of gluten, they can test their product, they can make sure it's free of gluten. There's no way they can assure that there are no wheat allergens. So yes, if you are a person with celiac disease and it has a GFCO certification label, it is definitely safe. If you have wheat allergies, then I would maybe pay more attention to those kind of precautionary labels. Okay, and then we did have the request, somebody did say please post the vinegar information. So um, if we could post that, I don't know if we can post that, what format is that in? Is that something we can put in as a handout or put it into the chat itself here? It's just a URL so people can go to the, can go to the site. So I'll send that over to, to you guys so you can put that up. All right. So I'm just waiting if there's any other questions coming in. Should be good. So, well, Laura, thank you. Thank you so much for your insight on that. Um, and uh, now that we know about these regulations and how they're defined, uh, we're going to bring in Lola O'Rourke uh, to talk about how these affect you and how you as the consumer, you know, should read labels for gluten-free foods and interpret those in your local stores. So, Lola, I'm going to go ahead and, and, pr and provide the presentation to you. Um, so, thank you again for joining us and um, go ahead and uh, start. Okay, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Laura. Um, so now that we've heard um, about some of the more technical regulatory aspects on labeling, I'm going to go ahead and get into how to read labels for gluten-free foods uh, when you're actually shopping for them in the grocery store. Uh, and there Lola, are, did you present, Lola, did you present your screen? I'm sorry. Yeah, is it not coming up? Panelists, does anyone else see the screen? How about now? There we see it. Oh, okay. I'll backtrack a bit here. Let's see. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I guess you could hear me, but not see uh, my slide. So just to follow up, I'm going to get into a little bit more of the practicalities of what to actually look for when you're shopping for gluten-free foods. Um, as an overview, there are really three key types of information on package that gluten-free consumers need to be aware of. 
Um, the first is either a label or logo indicating that a product has been certified. We just heard a, a bit about that and we'll hear more from our next speaker as well. If you see this on a product, you're done with label reading, um, you know that the product is gluten-free. Second type of information are gluten-free claims. Since the uh, FDA gluten-free labeling regulation um, came into effect in 2014, gluten-free is now defined and these products should be safe to consume. The regulation also applies to the similar phrases, no gluten, free of gluten, and without gluten. Um, this does apply to FDA regulated products. I'll get a little more into that shortly. And then the third type of information is um, back to the basic ingredients list. For products that are neither certified nor labeled gluten-free, it is essential to read ingredient labels. A couple things uh, that I want to point out that I think are confusing for gluten-free consumers. Um, Laura already talked quite a bit about this, but just to emphasize, those may contain or processed on shared equipment with wheat statements are not relevant to gluten-free products. Um, whether it's certified, labeled, or unlabeled, these statements for gluten-free consumers are not an indication of cross-contamination with gluten. Again, the contains wheat statement might be present on a gluten-free food. Uh, as Laura was explaining, if it's processed such that the product meets gluten-free definitions, I think this is very confusing to many people, especially those who are new to the gluten-free diet, since of course wheat is generally about the first thing that comes to mind as something to be avoided. But under certain conditions, a product can contain wheat as long as it has the necessary wording on it as well. So just a couple kind of unintuitive things that you might see. So now to products that are labeled gluten-free. The gluten-free labeling regulation applies to FDA regulated products. Um, these do make up the vast majority of the food supply, about 80%, but it, this is not the entirety of the food supply. Non-FDA regulated products include those regulated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, these are meat, poultry, processed eggs, in other words, eggs not in the shell. Um, and mixed foods that generally contain about 3% meat or poultry. So this would be soups and frozen entrees and that sort of thing. The TTB, which is the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, regulates most alcoholic beverages. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so basically with regard to food products, it's the USDA that does uh, regulate products in addition to the FDA. Now, the vast majority of USDA products are thought to voluntarily comply with FDA labeling regulations, in fact, 80 to 90 percent, but it is not a requirement. So on reading ingredient labels, um, this, this is with regard to products that are they're not certified gluten-free, they're not labeled gluten-free, um, just back to the basics. And this is what we all had to do um, before there were certified gluten-free products on the market and before the gluten-free labeling regulation. Uh, the basic ingredients to avoid, um, you can see them listed here. Again, wheat top of the list including all types and forms of wheat, such as spelt, einkorn, and couscous. More and more ancient wheats are becoming popular these days, so you need to watch out for all of those. Uh, rye, barley, um, triticale, as Laura mentioned, a hybrid product. Oats, unless they are certified gluten-free, and this is because there's a high risk of cross-contamination. Malt, which is derived from barley, and brewer's yeast, which is traditionally a byproduct of beer. Um, and is used not only in beer, but also can be used in other um, products, other baked goods as a yeast. Again, just mentioning here, um, since I'm saying, you know, wheat should be avoided, it can be present if it is something like wheat starch, which has been processed, and if the product meets gluten-free requirements and there is a statement to this effect on the label. So Lola, there's a couple questions that have come in um, concerning ingredients that uh -huh. probably this would be a good time to speak about. Um, okay. Somebody have asked, what about glucose uh, that states it could come from wheat or corn and it's listed on that ingredient label? Uh, glucose should be fine. It's highly processed enough that it is not going to contain gluten. Um, Laura, I don't know if you want to chime in on this at all as well. 
Yeah, by the, by the time you're at glucose, you're at a, a really refined carbohydrate. It's a sugar, basically, so there's no proteins left that would bother anyone with celiac disease. Um, and it's not even long chain carbohydrates that might affect somebody with a wheat allergy. So, yeah, that would be safe for either group. Okay. And then the other question, and I think um, this has been addressed, but again, to emphasize, somebody asked, if you have celiac disease, should you not eat any products that contain vinegar? This has been something that's been confusing for years. Um, no, you do not need to avoid all vinegars. Vinegars are distilled with the exception of malt vinegar, and malt vinegar comes from barley. So as we were saying earlier, malt vinegar needs to be avoided. Other vinegars are safe. So if you see, you know, simply the word vinegar on a label, that is something to, to be careful about and avoid the product unless you can confirm that it's not malt vinegar. A lot of product ingredient lists will specify the type of vinegar, you know, whether it's uh, cider vinegar, white wine vinegar, those vinegars are absolutely fine. Okay, and then we just, and one last question before we get going. There's a lot of good questions coming in. Keep them coming, everyone. Um, somebody asked, what does purity processed oats mean? And that could be a question either for you, Laura, or, or Lola, or Laura. I, I'm going to hand that one over yes, to Laura. <laughs> um, so purity protocol uh, oats, we actually published a, a definition of that fairly recently. I can, I can give that to uh, Chris or Michelle to put up as a handout for you guys. But it's basically grower controls and then processor controls to ensure that the oats aren't contaminated with wheat, rye, or barley. Um, so it's, it's processing plants that have contracts with their growers that, that tell them that they can't have a gluten grain on that field for at least the last three years. They have to have isolation strips around the field. They have to go out and pull non-oat plants during the growing season. And then once it gets into the processing facility, everything needs to be dedicated to gluten-free production. Um, there's a lot more details of it, which is why I'll, I'll go ahead and put that article up uh, for you guys to give out as a handout. Okay, um, Lola, go ahead. We, set, we have some more questions coming in, but uh, we'll, we'll address those as, as we continue to go here. So. Okay, so uh, looking for wheat on ingredient labels, again, due to the um, Falca allergen labeling requirement, um, wheat needs to be clearly indicated on FDA regulated products. So if starch or anything else is derived from wheat, has to be clearly indicated either in parentheses in the ingredient list or at the end of the ingredient list in the contained statement. Uh, rye and barley, as Laura mentioned, are not part of Balco, but they're usually listed by their common name, so they're fairly easy to identify. Again, the exceptions malt or malt extract, which are not terribly uncommon ingredients. Uh, those need to be avoided as they're derived from barley. Um, vinegar, we just had that conversation. Malt vinegar is the one that needs to be avoided. So if there's any lack of clarity regarding the type of vinegar, that needs to be investigated or avoided. With regard to USDA regulated products and reading ingredient labels on these, again, because they are not required to comply with um, Falca allergen labeling, it cannot be assumed that ingredients that come from wheat are going to clearly indicate that. The um, ingredients that you see listed here could be derived from wheat and gluten-free status needs to be confirmed. So starch, food starch, modified food starch, and dextrin are often derived from corn but could be derived from wheat. I wanted to say a little bit about naturally gluten-free products and labeling on these products. The FDA gluten-free labeling um, regulation is voluntary. Uh, certification is voluntary too, of course. So lack of a gluten-free label does not necessarily mean presence of gluten. Uh, there is risk of cross-contamination in the case of some naturally gluten-free products. I particularly want to call out oats um, and lentils, both. Important to choose certified gluten-free oats, certified or labeled gluten-free lentils. 
Same thing applies to any milled products from grains, beans, seeds, or legumes. So this would include um, gluten-free sorghum flour, garbanzo bean flour, uh, ground uh, flax seed, for example higher risk of cross-contamination. So important to choose certified or labeled products in those cases. When it comes to other categories of naturally gluten-free products, like fruits, frozen fruits, vegetables, and plain dairy products, these should be safe to consume, even if they're not labeled gluten-free. A couple things on label reading with regard to alcohol. Distilled alcoholic beverages in their pure form are gluten-free. Uh, this is because in the distillation process, even when um, an alcoholic product is made from wheat, for instance, which obviously contains gluten, the gluten proteins do not make it through the distillation process. So distilled alcoholic beverages in their pure form are gluten-free. Wine falls into this category as well. And when I say in their pure form, there are some products on the market that are sort of wine cooler type products or even flavored um, hard liquors. In those cases, ingredients, additional ingredients need to be looked at. When it comes to beers, beers are generally fermented, not distilled, and are traditionally made from a gluten containing grain, namely barley. The only beers that are safe to consume are those made from gluten-free grains like sorghum. And these are the only ones that can be labeled gluten-free. Probably everybody is aware of, um, at least to some degree, the controversy regarding gluten-removed beers um, on the market. These beers should be avoided. Uh, these are beers that have been made from gluten-containing grains presumably have been processed in such a way to break down or remove the gluten. Um, the processes for doing this and the processes for testing the gluten fragments that remain have not been scientifically validated, have not been shown to be safe. Uh, in fact, Laura was also involved in some research that GIG did on gluten removed beers, which showed that some people with celiac disease do react to gluten removed beers. It's interesting the labeling on gluten removed beers, I believe it can say either processed, treated, or crafted to remove gluten, but it is also required that there be a statement on these packages which says the gluten content of the product can't be determined and that the product may contain gluten. So those need to be avoided. So just in conclusion, um, you know, things certainly have gotten simpler in the last 15 years or so. Um, thanks to GFCO certification, which has been in existence since 2005, choose certified gluten-free products and you're good to go. Um, thanks to the gluten-free labeling regulation, has been in effect for a few years, choosing products which are labeled gluten-free, keeping in mind the caveat that not all products are covered by that, but the vast majority are. And then third, um, reading ingredient lists. And I just wanted to emphasize one last time to disregard those may contain type statements for purposes of choosing gluten-free foods. Maybe relevant for wheat allergy, but confusing as they are, um, they are not relevant to choosing gluten-free foods. Thank you. So, Lowell, thank you so much. We have some questions that have come in that I want to address at this time um, before we move on to our last presenter. And a lot of these in, in concerning uh, what you spoke about. So, in terms of like, what about packages that say naturally gluten free? Are those generally safe? Is that something that you still, we still should be checking the ingredient list on? Well, if it says naturally gluten-free, again, the, the products that are at high risk for cross-contamination and oats, lentils, and milled um, flours, and, and beans, nuts, and seeds, those should be either certified or labeled gluten-free. Um, naturally gluten-free is not a regulated statement. Um, if that is the only thing on the package, I would check ingredient labels as well. Okay. So, and you brought up lentils there. Someone had asked us, um, their lentils are organic. Do they still need to be labeled gluten-free? Yes. The organic or not organic status is not relevant to whether they're cross-contaminated with gluten. Okay.
We also had another question about um, about refining agents. So somebody has asked, I've heard that refining agents for wine uh, can be a source of gluten contamination. Um, is that something that um, that we've heard of? Is that take it out of that pure form? Can you comment on that? Yeah, my understanding is that, you know, at some time in the past, there was some sort of wheat byproduct used, um, well, a couple things, in wine barrels. I don't think that's the case any longer. Um, refining agents, um, I am not aware of any significant source of gluten that, that needs to be, an, you know, that people need to be concerned about. Uh, Laura, again, I don't know whether you, with regard to GFCO certification, um, have come across these ingredients and can share any information on this. Yeah, it's, it's not something that I think a lot of manufacturers are currently using. I think it's an older method for, for refining and clarifying wines. Um, but again, if they were using them, um, the TTB requests that everybody sort of follow the FDA labeling regulations. If they were adding wheat as a as a fining agent, they would have to label that on the or put that on the ingredient label. Okay. Uh, one and a final question uh, for for you, Lola, that has come in, and this has been on a lot of people's minds. So, um, with Cheerios, Cheerios being an example of volunteering gluten-free labeling. Um, does that decision by Canada to disallow the gluten-free claim on Cheerios sold there affect how they're labeled here? Uh, somebody also had, you know, uh, asked for differences of what's presented today uh, from, from here versus Canada. Um, and I'll open that up to any of our panelists to address. Yeah, my understanding is that, uh, no, it, it does not affect Cheerios in this market. In the U.S., in fact, um, according to General Mills, the product is exactly the same. It's still the same in Canada. They've just removed the label. Um, same product here, still labeled gluten-free. You know, with regard to how gluten-free status is determined and their processes, um, Laura might want to comment on that a bit. Yeah, Canada has that extra regulation that if you're going to put out a finished product with oats in it, you have to be able to say you started with gluten-free oats. Um, and I think that might be the snag they're running into. Um, they, they purify their oat stream as part of the product uh, development, as part of manufacturing the product, as opposed to starting with a clean oat stream to begin with. Um, so that may have been the, I don't know 100%, but uh, knowing that difference between the U.S. and the Canadian regulation, that may have been the snag they hit there. Okay. All right. Well, well, thank you, Lola. Again, a lot of great questions coming in, everyone. Um, we're going to try to get to as many as possible, but um, we want to move on uh, for sake of time. Uh, so have we seen now that uh, the labels and the statements and guidelines that are out there that create the consumer confusion? But one way to be certain about the products that you purchase is to look for that GFCO certification label. So I'm going to now reintroduce uh, Shannon Quinn uh, to talk about GFCO certification and what that process looks like, what differentiates it from other certification labels, and why it is, it is the most sought-after logo for uh, gluten-free consumers. So Shannon, welcome again, and I'll turn this over to you. Let me change presenters here so you have that. There we go. All right, so thanks everybody for all of that amazing information. Um, I'm gonna be quick because I know that we're starting to run out of time, but to reintroduce myself, I am the Vice President of Food Safety with the Gluten Intolerance Group. GSCO is uh, a pretty major project here in my office on a daily basis. So um, my whole goal is to give you a, a quick overview of what it is that we do in order to certify products. So as you've heard, um, we are the largest and oldest, most recognized gluten-free certifier in the U.S. Um, and we're very quickly expanding around the globe. So we were established in 2005, certifying our very first company um, out of a consumer need for clear labeling for grocery shopping um, to be easy. Very um, cumbersome label reading and things like that should, should have gone by the wayside. So, we came up with this program to make everyone's lives easier. 
Um, we created our trademark, which you can see here on this slide. I'm sure you've seen it on products that are in your pantry right now. Um, it, it visually represents the validation process that all of these products have gone through and now not only in the US but in 27 countries around the world. Um, based on research of safe gluten content for celiacs, the World Health Organization, codex limitations, um, as well as the feasibility and reliability of testing levels for gluten, GFCO was able to set our threshold at 10 parts per million or less. Um, this applies to not only the products, but also every single ingredient that goes into a GFCO certified product. This level, as you've heard, is twice as strict as the FDA labeling regulation, which passed in August of 2013, eight years after GFCO certified our first product. GFCO is the only gluten-free certifier who certifies products under the ISO 17065 accreditation. Let me say that again. We are the only certification program for gluten-free products that is third-party validated. We also are the only program to carry the certification or the accreditation, sorry, for the ISO 17065 and certified products. Um, there are other programs out there that I'm sure that you've heard about, um, much, much newer than GFCO. They do not certify products. They certify a facility. They validate that they, as the manufacturer, are following the rules that the manufacturer has set up. The mark that is on the products that they certify represents that they have validated only the processes that have already been set up in the manufacturing facility. To me, that leaves a lot of room for error. GFCO actually goes through a very thorough application process. We review product and, product and ingredient information, facility information, um, sourcing for raw materials, as well as standard operating procedures. We look at the training, production, packaging, cleaning, etc. We approve or issue corrective actions with every single audit that happens at every single facility that manufactures a product with our logo on it. With these rigid standards, we also require ongoing testing of not only the ingredients, but the finished products, and in a lot of cases, the manufacturing equipment as well. We do everything that we can to mitigate any risk that would be happening with the production of the products. Additionally, we at GFCO perform point of sale testing and surveillance. So we go out to marketplaces and we purchase products off the shelf and we submit it for testing. We order things from Amazon. We go and we order um, products off of Gluten-Free Mall or you know, any of the, the other places online where you can order products. We have our branches go out and collect products and all of these things are submitted throughout the year for ongoing testing none of which the companies that we certify would have any control over our access to. This not only validates what it is that we do, but that they're following through on their end of the certification contract. So once we go through and we do an audit of the facility and they have passed or corrected any um, outliers or any non-conformances that they have within their facility, then we're able to issue a certificate. We do visit these facilities at least once a year, every single year. So Shannon, there's a couple of questions that I'll come in about that, about that certification process. So is sure. every product or batch tested? Not every single one. So we actually have a testing matrix that is designed to evaluate the risk of the products, or I'm sorry, the risk of the ingredients the risk of the manufacturing facility. And based on that and the production frequency, that will determine what the testing actually looks like in every facility. So, you know, as you can assume, if you have a lower risk product or lower risk ingredients going into a lower risk product, you're gonna have less testing than someone who is producing, say for example, a bread product in a mixed use facility. That is probably going to be tested every single um, batch that they make or every single lot. Part of that depends on the, the definition that they use for either um, lot production 
which in some cases could be a whole day or a week, um, just depending on the, the volume of the production run. And, and there are so many details that vary between manufacturers that it, it's hard to pinpoint that, but know that there is a, a standard matrix for testing based on risk that every single GFCO company has to abide by. Okay. And then another question was, you know, with the audits, you mentioned that we're, we're doing yearly audits. Um, are those audits planned? Is there, what's stopping that company from, you know, making a temporary change? Is that the pulling the products off the shelf? Um, and, and, and a little bit more about that auditing process and what makes it so unique? Yeah. So we visit every single facility every single year. Um, we utilize third-party auditors. So our auditors don't actually care if the facility passes or fails. They are honestly just checking um, based on our standards. Um, in most cases, the audits are planned, so the facility knows that we're coming. However, we do also have the right to visit any manufacturing facility that produces GFCO products at any time that we want without notice. So if there's a problem reported and we are not getting a response from the company, we will be at that facility. Okay, thank you. Is that a question? Okay. Yeah, that, that, Perfect. That, that's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, just a little bit more of a, a push for GFCO. Why GFCO over these other certifications that are out there? And anyone who knows me knows these are my two beautiful babies. And um, if, if the reasons that we have given you already, the standards and the science and, and everything behind it is not enough, buckle your seatbelts because now I'm going to pull at your heartstrings. Um, I, what is it, Chris, probably 80% of our staff here at GIG has some sort of affiliation with someone who has celiac disease or gluten sensitivities. Um, my family is probably 80% gluten free uh, due to health concerns of some nature or another. But most important to me is my child. So um, as a mother, I would not put my name on something that I wouldn't feed my own child. Based on that, I want to reiterate the fact that our integrity is very, very important to us. Our reputation is the top because we do not bend. Um, we are not willing to compromise our program for a paycheck. So in addition, the companies that go through GSDO certification with us not only get the marketing benefit, they get the consumer confidence you all understand what this mark means and how important it is to the, the food that you're feeding your families, the food that restaurants are buying to serve to our families. Um, but they also get the customer support. So if a consumer has a question, we will answer that on behalf of the company or alongside the company. We have medical and scientific experts on staff. We conduct research programs like the, the beer study that we just completed and published. Um, we've got a spice study that went out. We've done oat studies, and, and there's a number of studies that are still in the works before we can, we can release them. But GOG is really here to serve our consumers. We are the only certification program that's run by a nonprofit. We're not in it for big houses and fancy cars. We're in it because there's a need in our community, and we are here to fill that need. So with that, are there any questions for any of us? I, there's a lot of questions that have been coming in, so I want to open this up to the I want to open it up to the whole panel here these last uh, five minutes. And and what I've decided to do is there are so many great questions that we're going to put together a list of all these questions, and we're going to address these. You're going to be receiving from us a, a follow-up survey uh, to this webinar. It's going to be coming to the email address that you registered under. And so we're going to be putting together a list of all of these questions and we're going to be answering them because there are just a tremendous amount of questions coming in uh, and, and they're all really, really great questions. And unfortunately with the timing, we're not going to get a chance to all, all of them. But I want to um, get into a couple of ones that have come in here, um, especially concerning um, the labeling and, and, and some questions I can combine, like how can we report products that's, uh, you know, that's maybe using the GFCO logo incorrectly or if they see a generic GF uh, without uh, the certified uh, wording, you know, what, what can be done in that situation by a consumer? So 
So I guess I'm going to jump in here. Um, if there are concerns about it, bring it to us. My contact information is on the website. Laura's contact information is on the website. You can get a hold of any of our GFCO staff, and we would be more than happy to address it. Um, the, the first step in the process, obviously, is the reporting. So you have to let us know. We have a lot of eyes out there, but we don't have all of them. So if you see something where you have a, a question or a concern, reach out to us. We're really friendly people. We would love to talk it through with you. And if there is, in fact, a problem, we will go back and resolve that and let you know that it's been you know, handled or, or recalled or whatever, um, whatever the appropriate action would be. And kind of a follow up to that question, Shannon, is, you know, how many consumer complaints does it take before a uh, product is inspected or pulled from the shelves? One. <laughs> so if, if we have one complaint, we launch an investigation. Okay. Um, and I think and there's another question about uh, talking to us or how do we report if we got sick from the GFCO product. That's the same response that Shannon just gave. You know, reach out to us. Let us know. We're, we're very friendly people. We want to help. We're part of this community, as Shannon so um, eloquently stated. You know, this is affecting a lot of us. And so we, we want these labels to be as clear as possible. We want people to feel safe uh, when they, you know, when they're picking the product up that has the, the GFCO label on that. Um, two more, another question just real quick, uh, somebody asked if we do anything other than food, but then there was another question about cosmetics and personal care products like lotions yeah. and shampoos. Are, yeah, are there, are there specific ingredients with those that we need to watch for? Well, you'd be surprised what they put in things that you put on your face. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, it would be the, the same kinds of things that you would look for in your foods. A lot of times there are oats put into exfoliants or put into lotions. Um, I know for a long time, that's what they would tell you. If you had DH, they would tell you to go take an oatmeal bath, not realizing that they were asking you to poison yourself in a bathtub. So, you know, look for the same kinds of things that you wouldn't be able to consume. Um, most of those companies that make cosmetics or shampoos, soaps, will list on there the, the allergens, the true allergens, um, but, you know, they, there's a lot of chemicals. <laughs> They're really hard to read labels. So look for the things that make sense to you. And if you have questions, call the, call the companies. If they can't answer it, don't buy it. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Shannon, for that insight. There's one more um, topic that I want to bring back up because there's been a few questions that have come in. And, and Lola, uh, this will be um, for you and probably Laura as well. Uh, you, had, you had said that you know, with may contain statements, um, for the purpose of choosing gluten-free foods, that's something that can be disregarded. Uh, can you, I, I think there needs to be more clarification as to, as to when those statements are to be looked at and when they, when they shouldn't be looked at. Uh, well, I think um, the, the basic distinction is that for people who have a wheat allergy, then they can be relevant. For people who are looking for gluten-free products, they are not relevant. Okay. Well, th thank you, Lola, for, for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and and wrap it up now. Um, I would love to be able to address all these questions, but at this time I, we just we we're running we run out of time. And so I want to thank everybody who has participated um, in this gluten free labeling webinar. Additional supplemental pieces uh, on this topic include in a white paper and infographic on labeling. They're in the handout here on the handouts here, but they can also be found um, on the home pages of both uh, gluten.org and www.gfco.org. They're right there, the first homepage slider that pops up. Uh, you'll also be receiving a recorded uh, version of this webinar. Um, that's gonna be available to you in the next couple days. And again, we're gonna be sending out that follow-up survey. We'll include with that a list of questions um, and answers that we did and did not get to. So look for those in the, in the next uh, probably seven to 10 days from us um, as we get that survey ready. So again, uh, thank you for being on this webinar. Uh, thank you for being a part of this great community. And we appreciate your time today with us. So thanks and have a great rest of your week, everyone.